I am genuinely excited about uh, this session. Um, as Caroline said, I've been teaching since 1988, um, and I've taught every year. So I, as, a, as a teaching head teacher, um, I've taught every year. I've taught out my subject. I've taught to A-level economics, English, and media studies, to GCSE. You can add those three subjects plus media studies and leisure and tourism. I've taught business studies, GCSE. So I've just teach a lot um, and work really hard at it. And um, I think it's really important to, to say that first, because um, if I were you um, sitting there um, about to enter the profession or a year in, I'd be thinking, what's, what's someone who's just about to retire got to say to me? Um, and so what I'm really, really working at, and I'm, and I'm, I'm retiring from the, from, from the teaching profession, but I'm not retiring um, I'm putting my feet up. I'm doing lots of consultancy work and hope to be working um, with Caroline and the, and the Bolton Learning Partnership in the future. But um, I, I kind of want to pass on some of the wisdom that I have. So I've got way too many slides, um, but hopefully I can ping through them and, and give you some insights into what I've learned over the last 33 years and what I wish I'd known when I was in your position 33 years ago. Um, I, I think that's that's the case, right? So you've got a really important job, right? You've got a really important job and you've got an obligation to be as good as you possibly can be because as Thomas Sell says, um, if we get it wrong, uh, it doesn't really affect us, does it? It affects the people in front of us. So it's, it's really crucial we take this seriously, um, but um, have a sense of perspective about it. I taught for 25 years, right? So I've been a head teacher for 18. Um, but the first 25 years of my career, um, it's kind of 25 years of hurt, really, because if I'm really, really honest, um, I didn't really know what I was doing. I got by on force of character and enthusiasm. But eight years ago, I started working really hard with uh, a man called Alex Quigley. You might have heard of Alex Quigley written some brilliant books on on literacy on, on uh, reading and vocabulary and Alex started at our places at NQT and he and I got really stuck into from around 2010 and then really really strongly in 2013 looking at research and evidence-informed practice um, and so in the last eight years I think I've become a much better teacher than I was in the first 25 um, and I've had a, a, a halcyon end of my career, really. I, I think I'm a better teacher now than I've ever been. But it is a pretty tricky job. Um, and you know, when, you're, when, you're sitting, when you're standing there in front of a class of students um, and you, you'll have 30 in a class, it's tricky. And, and I think the quotation that I like most about, about this is, is Lee Shulman's quotation. You might have come across it. Um, just what a terrifying situation it is to stand in front of 30 people um, and try and teach them because it's incredibly difficult. Uh, and, and to know that what you've taught them, um, they have learned, is, is, a, is a massive step. And lesson after lesson after lesson, you can think I've taught them that, um, and then you find out they haven't learned a thing. Um, so the difference between you teaching them and them learning it is, is very, very tricky. One of, my, one of my key kind of philosophies really is, is simplexity. Um, and one of the things I say to my colleagues is that I cannot make the job of teaching any easier because it's a damned difficult thing to do as Lee Shulman explained. But what I can do is make it as easy as possible for them to teach as well as they can. So my job as a head teacher is to keep things really simple, not overload people, think about workload, and make sure that people have the time and the expertise and the training to do a really great job. So at Huntington, for instance, we have, um, if you're a subject leader, you have 71 hours of ring fence training time a year because I just can't wish you to get better at your job. You have to have the time to do it. But in the end, it's about making the complex simple. So simplexity for me is a watchword. If you go to this document, 2007, um, the McKinsey um, report on, it was called there, uh, how the world's best performing school systems come out on top. 
It's a really interesting read. And there's a, there's a line from it. And I think it's even a line that was stolen by McKinsey from someone else. But there's a line there in the top corner, the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And that's a really important statement and it gets banded about a great deal. So the onus is on you. The onus is the only thing that really matters um, is, is the quality of what you do in the classroom. Um, and I think we found that during lockdown. There's been some successes of lockdown, but in the end, people just wanted to get back to face-to-face -to -face teaching, both teachers and students. It's the, there's no substitute for, for being in front of a class and having that, uh, that connection. But a few years ago, um, a man called Chris Husbands, who's, the, who's uh, Sir Chris Husbands now, who's the um, vice chancellor of Sheffield Hallam University, um, wrote a really interesting blog called Why McKinsey is Wrong. Um, and this is his main, his main issue. Is it's not teachers, it's teaching. It, not teachers, but teaching. Because every single one of us can teach a pretty bad lesson. Right? It doesn't make us a bad teacher. Um, but we can, you know, there are days when it just doesn't happen. There are days when you might even be close to winging it and you have a brilliant lesson. Um, and sometimes when you've planned to the nth degree a lesson and it just doesn't work and what you thought would work um, doesn't cut the mustard in the classroom. So it's about teaching, not teachers. And I think one of the things you must do, and you have, you have to be really clear minded about this as you go through your career, is remove yourself distinguish between yourself and practice right um and what i mean by that is 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 be able to step back from yourself and look at the practice rather than see it as a personal thing now teaching is an incredibly personal thing because a lot of it depends upon relationships but there are some practices that work better than others and you've got to be really clear that actually if you get someone who's supporting you and coaching you um and mentoring you who may say, I wouldn't do this, you do that. Um, don't take it to heart. You're just working on the practice and it's nothing personal. At Huntington, um, we have this on the wall of our, of our research school, um, a really famous quotation from Dylan William. I've got a couple to, to, to show you, um, but I think that's the case. At Huntington, I say I, I'm really not interested in having employing anybody who doesn't accept the professional obligation to get better at their practice. And that includes me. When I say every single member of the SRT teaches, and they teach exam classes, they teach difficult classes, um, there's no cherry picking. Uh, and I think that's really important. And we work really hard on our practice. In September, I won't be doing it this September, in September, I stand in front of the whole 120 teachers and the support staff, and I go through my um, my my students' exam results, good, bad, and ugly, and I and I analyse them publicly because I think that's a really important thing to do. If I'm asking my staff to do that, that's what um, I think I should be doing that too. So that's crucial that every single one of us in a school accepts the professional obligation to improve their practice, um, because we always can, as Dylan says. And, and the trouble is, people think there are shortcuts to getting better. Right, so this line by Dylan William is another one, um, and I, you know, I have a I have a reputation. I'll apologise now for being a, a massive name dropper, right? And I and I and I I do it for a bit of tongue in cheek fun, really. But I was having a conversation with Dylan William last week about this quote, and he was laughing. And I don't if you, I, I tweeted it out on uh, I put it out on Twitter last night. And he got in a conversation with me about it with a with a with a wry grin. But it really is important. Um, you know, don't think that you're going to find um, a great solution to all your teaching and learning ills overnight and take something last night um, and take it into the classroom tomorrow. I remember about a dozen years ago, we were we, we were having a teaching and learning community training program at Huntington and on the Monday night. We played a three minute video of Dylan Williams saying that if you get students to invent examination questions, to, to construct con examination questions, you can find out how much they know. I went around the school in the morning and I found three teachers asking students to do that. They'd had no time to prepare to do that. 
to, to create really good examination questions, you have to show students how to do it. You know, it takes exam boards months and months to create good questions. And yet our, my, three of my staff were replicating that the next day. It was a complete waste of time. You cannot find the kind of the little tricks that are going to transform your teaching. Everybody wants them, doesn't happen. And that's an idea that Vivian Robinson uh, also promotes. And that quotation there is from the walkthrough booklet, the first walkthrough booklet, um, which I'm going to talk about in, in, some, in some detail in, in, in a few minutes. There are no silver bullets. You have to work really hard on your practice. Um, and that book there, if you haven't, if you, I'm going to recommend two or three books for you to read. That's a brilliant book. Um, especially if you're interested in school leadership and have aspirations to to move into middle leadership and senior leadership. That's a brilliant book about why there's far too much change um, and no improvement. So we have to reduce the amount of change in schools um, and increase uh, improvement as a, as a result. Um, for instance, you know, at Huntington, we've been working on just two things for about seven years now, which is just eight years, metacognition and, and literacy. Um, and that's all, we're, that's all we're working on next year as well. Because uh, actually, if you get those two things right, you'll get a lot of things right in the classroom. So I think this is really important. Uh, and I think this is from Tom Sherrington. And it's a, it's a brilliant blog. That's the title of the blog, A Model for the Learning Process, Why It Helps to Have One. I never had one, right? When I was trained as a teacher, um, back in 1987 to 88 at Sussex University, no one taught me this. I had no idea how people learn. My first couple of years of teaching, I just really mimicked the best teachers that I had. Um, and that's all I did. And I got, as I said, I got by on uh, force of character and enthusiasm. But understanding how students learn, having a model of how students learn, I think is really, really important. So some of the cognitive science stuff that is around at the moment, I think is is has revolutionized teaching in the last decade. Uh, there's a there's a couple of books I'm going to recommend now, but read that blog by Tom. It's a really good blog and gives you a good sense. He, he really he really delineates it beautifully about how young people, how our brains learn, how we learn, and how we have a, a working memory and a long term memory, um, and how we forget loads of stuff um, and how we embed stuff in our long term memory, which is essentially learning. So. Um, I would recommend that you have a model um, for the learning process. Tom's is a very good one, but there are other ones out there as well. Um, but if you do have that, then you've got a better chance of, of modifying your teaching so that students learn better, which is surely um, the whole thing. Now, Graham Nuttall's book, if you want to read one book about how, to, how students learn, I think uh, it would be The Hidden Lives of Learners by Graham Nuttall. Nuttall died in 2008, I think, or 2007. Um, and he very quickly, when he found out he was terminally ill, wrote up um, his findings. He's, he'd, been, he'd been a lifetime educational researcher and, and wrote up his findings. And he would go into a school and put all the cameras in and the microphones in, and he would he would take a class over several weeks and do all the recordings and, and listen to all the all the conversations that were going on in it between two Preston Hill who doesn't know where his letter is. Could you turn your microphones off, please? Um Hello, are you still there? Just turn your microphone off, thank you. Um, um and what he would do would be to um, he got all the information together and he wrote it up very quickly at the end of his life. And it's a brilliant, brilliant book. And he said there are three um, lives of learners in a classroom. There's one, which is the relationship they have with you, and you can have that conversation with them. That's one life they have. Second life is the conversations they have with their peers, which is much more important than the one with you. The one with you is, is based on just saying what you really want, what, what, what they think you want to hear. Um, but the ones with their, with, their, with their peers is really important. And then the last one is the life they're having in their head as they're trying to learn this stuff. And we have kind of proxies for that in terms of assessments and trying to work out if they've learned what, what, what we've taught them. Um, and they could get, he, 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 and his, he and his team could watch a series of lessons, I don't know, six, six or eight lessons, and determine to within 80 to 90% um, certainty who had learned something and who hadn't. Um, when it came to the assessment at the end of the 
series of lessons. And he, one of his main findings is that students, in order to learn something because of, of, of forgetting material, they have to experience a topic or a sub or, or, or an item or something that you want them to learn three times. I got so obsessed with this about six years ago that my economic students knew more about Nuttall's theory than they did about the economics. I'd say to them, how many times have you got to learn this? And they'd say three. Um, they couldn't tell me um, what supply and demand curve ha you know, curves ha did. So um, brilliant book. I recommend that massively. And then Williams just republished Why Don't Students Like School, which is um, another absolute masterpiece um, about why thinking hard is anathema to most students, most people. Um, and that's why they don't like school. But if, you, not, if they're not thinking hard, they're probably not learning. So there's a little intro. Um, I'm now gonna talk a little bit about um, the walkthroughs. I think they are a work of genius. Um, now, Tom is a friend, but I, you know, I just think they're, they're unbelievable. I saw when I was doing some curriculum masterclasses with him a couple of years ago, I saw some of the drafts and was blown away by them. And Oliver's, Oliver's um, illustrations are just second to none. So you're gonna, I'm going to just talk briefly along the five, the five areas. I'm not going to talk about mode B teaching, just the five areas that you're covering in the sessions later today. Um, and the first one is behaviour and relationships. If you don't get behaviour right, you can't teach, right? You really cannot teach. Um, and I think there's lots to do um, that's relatively simple about behaviour. Um, some of it is having courage. Um, a lot of it is about doing some simple things really, really well. Um, and there's a brilliant book. I don't know if you've come across this book by Doug Lamov. He's just republished it, um, the third version of it. And one of the things that I work with some of my younger teachers is getting 100% attention. Um, because if you don't get 100, 99% is no good. You have to get 100%. And there's some brilliant um, techniques, both in the walkthroughs and also in Teach Like a Champion, about how to get 100% attention. Um, and I never talk over anybody. I, you know, if, if, if there's a student talking, I just stop. Now, I've got at my age and stage a thousand advantages over, over you guys because I, um, I'm the head teacher. It's really helpful being a head teacher in terms of getting um, good behavior in class. I get that. But I still do really sensible things all the time. Pens down, properly pens down, no exceptions. Eye contact. I want everybody looking at me. Um, and I'm not speaking till you stop speaking. And it's really simple. Um, so two or three things like that to get 100% attention is absolutely crucial. The other thing that I really like doing is filming myself teaching. Um, and I think that I think we, we've used the IRIS program. I don't know what's, what we're going to use next year because I think everybody's now got completely used to um, using video. Um, but for me, using the IRIS program was revolutionary. Um, and it would be really nice if I, was, if I was presenting live to you, I'd show you some video of myself. But uh, um, a few years ago, we did some coaching and I was being coached by an NQT drama teacher and I showed her this video and you can see um, I've asked Ryan in the front row a question and what she pointed out was my body language. So it looks like I'm shooting him, right? And if you look at Ryan, it looks like he's been shot. Um, and I asked him this question and he's probably the, he was probably the, probably, the, the weakest student in the class. And there I am shooting him. Uh, quite, quite remarkable, really. And she pointed out my body language. And actually, he didn't know the answer. And I just waited and waited. And I just held the silence. And at one point, I started chewing the pen um, that I'd got in my hand um, just to, you know, to, to, I don't know why I was doing it, really. And she pointed it all out. And it was really brilliant. So it wasn't brilliant for Ryan, but it was, it was a really brilliant um bit of coaching from an NQT, and there I am teaching my A-level economics class. Um, so the next lesson, I work really hard on my posture and the use of my hands. So if you watch the whole video, it's the same room, I've changed the angle of the camera, and I worked so hard to keep my hands on, on my thigh. Um, and there was a couple of times in the video where they kind of rise up and I whack them back down. Um, but 
being deliberate about your practice at a minuscule level, at micro granular level, I think is the only way to improve your teaching. Um, and I, you can find the videos. I, they might be on my blog, but I've just redone my blog. But I, I posted them on my blog a few years ago. And uh, um, just to return to this, a, a woman in the a woman in the department in the business studies and economics department came along to me and said, oh, "I love that video. I really loved it. Um, it was great to see it. And it was great to see Harry. There's Harry. Great to see Harry." Um, looking at his phone and texting and replying to a text he'd just got. And I'd not seen it. I'd put it out for the world to see in a school which bans mobile phones. And there's Harry text, reading a text. He's clearly got a vibration in his leg, shows the girl next to him, and then starts replying while I'm holding the, holding the, the silence with Ryan. Um, so when you watch yourself on video, you see stuff that you just don't see. And when you are working with someone on improving your teaching, what's great about it is there's no debate about what happened in the lesson. Sometimes you, you'll, you'll observe a lesson and you'll say, well, you did this. And they say, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. And it just becomes like a, a, a row about what happened in the lesson. When you watch it on video, it's just tremendous. Um, so a couple of things there, really methodical, work on tiny things, um, and don't be averse to watching yourself on video. So this last little bit about, about how important it is to practice the micro um, came to me this morning. I've just been on, on Twitter and Chris Moyes, um, who I, I respect greatly, was talking about practice and controlled conditions. So Doug Lamoff is massively into that. So working really hard on practicing um, the micro stuff. Um, and he didn't really think that would be that, that would be much good. But then Rachel Ball replied like that this morning, just a, a few minutes ago. Um, I've actually found practicing contrition is really useful. Standing at your door and greeting students sounds really easy as an expert, but actually there's a fair amount of skill involved in keeping one eye on the rest of the class, controlling the flow, being positive and greeting, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And she's so right. <laughs> People say greet them at the door, but they never tell you how to greet them at the door. And there's an absolute skill in it. There's a skill in, in keeping your eye down the corridor and making sure when they've walked in, they've gone with the bell work that's on the board um, and you're managing all that as well as being really, really kind of positive when you greet them. So be precise, be micro, be granular um, and get better that way incrementally. So curriculum planning. You can be the really good pedagogic practitioner, you can have great behavior, but if you don't um, have a great curriculum, what's the point? And there is a really basic fact and a really, it's a basic fact for all of us. Okay, so I've got grade A, A-level maths. Um, and I know that 32X squared is 64X so when you differentiate it. But I have no idea why. I have no, no idea whatsoever why that is. So I know that, but I don't understand it. So I could never teach differentiation to a level where people understand it. I can hoop jump, but I can never do it um, to, to a level where people understand it because I don't um, understand it myself. So you have to be really good at every level, uh, really knowledgeable about the curriculum that you're teaching. And especially senior leaders, and I've been obsessed at the moment about that from a senior leader point of view, um, because if I'm trying to help you improve your teaching, um, you're not going to take any notice of me if you don't think I'm good at it too. That's why I think everybody should teach. My first book, which I'll reference at the end, called Love Over Fear, was going to be called Why Head Teacher Should Be the Best Teacher in the School, um, because I still think that's really important that you can cut the mustard, and then you gain a lot of respect from colleagues. Um, when you when you when you when you can actually talk about practice i have a problem at the moment it's called and i call it the problem with cherry 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 bailey is the lima is is the subject leader for our languages in our school and she's absolutely brilliant she's got a double first in cambridge and german from cambridge in, in, in german and russian from cambridge university um and i've got a cse grade one from 1980 I imagine way before any of you were born. Now, um, I know that Ikfara Medem Zugnak Brighton means I travel to Brighton on the train, but um, that's all I remember from my CSE. So how can I 
help Cherry develop the curriculum uh, with, with so little understanding of languages and how people learn languages. So um, I've been working with a woman called Mary Myatt. You might have come across Mary Myatt in your travels. And we've been interviewing um, brilliant subject leaders from across the country for a book we're writing called Huh. The book's called H-U-H. Huh. Um, I'll tell you about that in a second, why it's called that in a second. But we've been having Zoom meetings. We've done 19 hour and a half interviews in the evenings, beginning at seven and ending at half eight, with the, some of the best subject leaders I could find around the country, asking them about how they construct their curriculum. It's been absolutely fascinating. I've been doing it in the last three months of my career, um, and I wish I'd done it 33 years ago. I certainly wish I'd done it when I became a head 18 years ago. And, you know, I, was, I became a curriculum deputy in 1998. So what's that, 23 years ago? I should have done it then. Um, but I've done it with a few weeks left to go. But I'm going to hopefully pass it on. And we've found some out some brilliant stuff. So we've asked them, this is David Hibbert and Kat Priggs on history, ask them, what's the knob, what's the core of what you need to learn um, in in your subject and there if you're a historian um, that might be really really helpful substantive knowledge disciplinary knowledge and substantive concepts and a lot of the work of Christian Council is behind that but I think they were absolute genius a pair of genius people talking about history and then um, what I really like is is one of the things I want to say to you is to really really challenge students students don't like easy work don't patronise your students with easy work, with stuff that's been downloaded by Twinkle, from Twinkle. Challenge them massively. Um, and Nikki McGee on Religious Studies from over in Norwich, in the Inspiration Trust, um, was just a, one of the most brilliant conversations. So if you're involved, and you must get involved in curriculum design and curriculum development, this is a really good question. You know, if you've got a scheme of learning that you're given when you go to your new school, just ask that question. Why do we teach that to those students at that point in the scheme of learning? It's a great question. Right? At every level, it's a great question. Um, and if, you, if there's no answer, then there's a problem. Um, and so all the work we've done with Mary and these chapters uh, and these, um, these interviews are going to be published as a chapter for each subject in the national curriculum um, as a starting point for debate. Right? So the best way to get involved in curriculum development um, as you start your journey in your career is to get chatting to people about what they're teaching and why they're teaching it, what choices they've made about why, they, why, they, why they're teaching what they teach. Um, it's, a, it's a great way, it's the only way um, to get underneath what goes on in schools. Um, the book, there's the book called Huh? Curriculum Conversations Between Subject and Senior Leaders. Um, Claire Hill, one of the, one of the, she's a director of, of, of curriculum for a, for a major trust in the country. Um, she said that when we interviewed her, because um, it is a never ending process. You're always reviewing what you're teaching to people. And um, it's called her because um, if you type in, because it's an endless task, I typed into Google, um, who's the god of endlessness? And it turns out there's an Egyptian god of endlessness called who. Huh. He's he's the god of, of of endlessness and creativity. So we thought that was a really um, good thing to call the book. Um, also, it's usually my response when I go into a modern languages class. So modelling, um, something that I'm absolutely obsessed with. Uh, if you haven't got a visualizer, get yourself a visualizer. I think they are brilliant. Um, lots of people are using visualizers. We've got one in every classroom now. We use, we use them during the lockdown to help because they the ones that we have from IPVO have a microphone in them. So when we were doing online remote learning, they were really, really helpful. Um, but I've, I've written something about, I've done lots of work with visualizers. I, I've taught, I've, I've shown um, 120 students at a time in, in the hall um, how to write an answer to an English GCSE question um, using a vision and, and the visualizer is crucial to to, pro, to um, project the image of what I'm writing up on up on the, the screen in, in the main hall um, so it's really really they're really brilliant things but they can also be used really badly so I once a few years ago insisted that every 
every English teacher um, modelled a written answer to question, the, the, the question five, paper one, in the AQA English GCSE language. And I said, are you going to do it tomorrow? So no one had a, most people were terrified. No one had a chance to, um, to practice. I gave them a visualizer and it was generally a disaster because no, because there were enough people there who knew what they were doing with the visualizer and how to make it work. So I have, I think it's a 10, 11 point um, list of things you have to think about when you are going to use a visualizer. Um, and you may think these are incredibly prosaic, but every single one of them matters, right? Just checking you've got the software loaded uh, <laughs> is crucial. Um, sometimes the connection where, where it goes in doesn't work. So I take a small piece of blue tape with me to make sure it sticks in, the wire sticks into the back of the visualizer. Um, I think it's really important to have enough space. You need almost a, almost a double desk, but certainly a big teacher desk. Um, I think that's crucial. The wires can get in the way really easily, so practice about where you have the wires. Um, that angle is is completely useful because actually, if you don't get the angle of the paper right, writing could become feel a bit awkward. Uh, I think that is a really good piece of advice. Um, you have to keep an eye about where you think the camera is because you're doing, in a, in a sensory sense, you're doing several things at the same time. Um, and it takes quite a bit of practice. Uh, that's what you find. You have to push the, push. you have to keep the pen in the same place under the camera. So you have to push the paper away. So sometimes it hits the stand of the visualizer and gets stuck. So beware of that. Um, Keep checking what they're seeing because sometimes you can you can be writing, you're getting stuck into the essay you're writing that they're they're copying or whatever it is you're doing, um, and you can actually look up and actually they can't see it at all, and none of them, and they're all too polite to say, "Boy, sir, I can't see what you're writing." Uh, always good thick black ink. Um, wait at the end of when you're if you're writing an essay and talking through how you write the essay, modelling your thinking. Be sure to let them catch up. Um, and then read from the PC screen, because in the end, um, if you're reading from the paper, then you, you may go too quick. You must put the paper underneath the visualizer and then read off the screen so you know what they're seeing, not what you can see. So the point, the reason I, I put all those things out is just to show how to get good at something you have to think really hard about it and practice, practice, practice. I've been using a visualizer now for about seven years and six years. And they probably they absolutely transformed my teaching. Um, and in terms of modeling, in terms of thinking about what you do, um, I, we published at Hunting, we published this book back in, back in February called Cognitive, Cognitive Apprenticeship in Action. Cognitive Apprenticeship is a, is a research paper written by, um, written by Alan Collins and, and a couple of other people back in 1991. And it's a brilliant paper and you can find it online. You can find it in my blogs. Actually, there's a copy of it in the back of that book. Um, and what I did was uh, talk with Tom about uh, writing the book. And we decided that what we would do is get every subject specialist at Huntington um, one one per subject to write a short essay about how they make expert thinking in their subject like so expert thinking as a physicist expert teaching experts subject thinking as a food nutritionist um and how you teach that expert thinking to children so i asked three questions how do you think like an expert how do you make that thinking visible to students then how do you teach them um, that thinking, um, and it was it's been it's been really good fun, um, and it's been lovely uh, for my colleagues to to get their names in print, and um, it's a it's 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 a they're they're absolute nuggets. Only twelve hundred words long each essay, um, but nuggets of of genius in there. So that's modelling. There's lots of really good stuff in Tom's book about modelling. 
And then questioning and feedback is the fourth section you'll be looking at today. Um, I think I, I just put a brief thing in here. MCQs, multiple choice questions. As an English teacher at heart, I, they were anathema to me. Right? I never thought I'd ever be using them. And I've been I've completely changed my mind. So one of the things you can do in teaching over your career is have some set views and some set ideas about something. And actually, you can change your mind. And that's that's fine. And I think MCQs incredibly useful for finding out what students know really efficiently. It's hard to write good ones, hard to write good MCQs. And you may think, well, that MCQ looks really easy. I'm sure they, they won't, you know, they, you might have 10 MCQs at the start of a short, um, uh, high challenge, low stakes um, formative assessment. You might think they're a waste of time, but they really do sort out who knows stuff and who doesn't, um, no matter how simple you might think they, they'll be. Fifth one then, the fifth section you'll be looking at is a practice and retrieval. And I'm gonna reference something from Tom again. Um, you know, the question is, when you one of the biggest challenges when you teach a class of 30 students is who's learned it and who hasn't. Um, and you might have heard Tom talk about this, but he does a brilliant, a brilliant one of his brilliant blogs, and probably his most popular blog is that one, the number one problem weakness in teaching and how to address it. And that is essentially how you know whether someone has learned something or not, and whether the class has learned it, who in the class has learned it and who hasn't, how many out of all the people you've taught know it and who who don't um and it's brilliant and he's got several solutions for it and he did an hour session with our colleagues not long ago a couple of months ago um about it he did a whole hour just answering that problem um and they thought it was was superb and one of the things i see is is people using mini whiteboards you know put them up great I see many whiteboards used so, 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 so badly again and again and again and again and again because people haven't thought through exactly how to do it. So um, if you've got two students sitting next to each other and you're writing on the right boards, they can just copy cut each other. Um, when if you don't ask for them to be put up simultaneously, three, two, one, up, then if they just put them up randomly, you can have a look at the person who's always going to get the right answer and just copy it down. Yeah, no, the, the actual function of them to find out who knows what um, is lost in the bad practice. The great thing about you being using the walkthroughs is for every single thing like that, every tiny technique, there's a brilliant, there's a brilliant five-step guide. And there's the one on, he calls it show me boards. It's really good. Um, it's exactly, it's exactly what I would, uh, say you should do number four there three two one show me right if you don't do that if you don't have them actually hiding what they're what they're writing turning it over so the other person next to them can't see three two one up and then hold them right up i watched one the other day where the lab was just waving it around the teacher had no chance of seeing it but she didn't say anything to the student so thinking really hard about stuff like that really helps the discipline in the classroom and the orderliness of how you practice so what I love about these things as well is that um, and you'll be taking through this if you haven't been taken through already, is the adapt element of it. So one of the thinking, as Tom says there, about how to use walkthroughs is that they're not entirely prescriptive. There's a recipe, but it's not rigid um, and it's, you don't have to stick to it. Um, verbatim you can you can shape it for yourself and i've seen a you know a, a couple of people there's the robinson quote a couple of people um on twitter really raving about how they've actually taken one of the one of the steps and it might be that that one there about using whiteboards um and how they've made it their own um so if you go through that pro if you go through the adapt process um, you've got a chance of whichever one you're going to be working on of, of making them work. And here's a couple of examples. So that was a, a, lad, a man called Ian Roberts. Um, and you get those kind of um, attempt uh, sheets, which are, which are just brilliant. Um, and here's another one where uh, someone in the science department was just getting, was thinking through the stuff um, and she didn't need to use um the, the pro forma from tom but was thinking hard about what, what we're doing and, and the walkthrough process so adapt i i think i i can't recommend them um 
enough. Uh, I think I think they're brilliant, and it emphasizes the granularity and the and the micro attention to the detail that you need to become a better teacher. Can you turn your microphone off, please. Um, you saw my quote. My um, I'm just about to finish with a few reflections now. You saw my uh, quote from Dylan William about the magpie. Uh, earlier I, I put it out on Twitter last night and Ellie Russell replied I replied to that and then Dylan replied to me and he did hashtag opportunity cost and I had already um, put this slide into the presentation so one of the things you need to remember uh, and I wish I'd thought about it more when I started teaching is, is opportunity cost I remember when I began Media Studies A level at Huntington with um, a lad with a, with a colleague called Carl, who's still there. Um, we used to have in, in the A level genre section there were five things you had to cover about each item from a genre. So we did film genre, did the gangster movie. There are five things you had to um, cover uh, according to to the specification. So I used to do um, a a, a sheet, a pro forma, which had the five um, elements you had to cover. Um, so iconography, whatever it might be. And I spent more time than I can possibly imagine finding um, original film posters of the film and putting them into uh, a water, as a watermark on each sheet. So they got the sheets and it might be the Asphalt Jungle, 1950, which, which had an original poster underneath it, and then the five, the five points they had to cover. Now we were using back, you know, back in 2000, really slow machines, and these were big, heavy, um, weighty uh, posters, and it took me forever, and I just didn't need to do it, and I could have done a lot of stuff both either with, with in teaching or out of teaching and all the time it took those images to, to sh shudder across the page and, and, and finally settle as, as a watermark on those, on those sheets. What a waste of time. Um, think about that. Think about the opportunity cost. What are you not doing if you're doing what you are doing? And could you be doing something better that would have more impact on students' outcomes? Okay. I spoke to David Carter once, Sir David Carter, who was um, the National Schools Commissioner. And I think that's a really great quote. Don't, oh, don't push yourself too hard. Don't think you've got to teach outstanding lessons all the time, whatever that means. Um, it really isn't what you have to do. Just be consistently good. Um, make sure you put the effort in, just be consistently good. That is outstanding. Um, you can change your mind. Um, I never thought I would be saying a dozen years on, 11 years on from when Gove over, took over at um, Great Smith Street, the DFE, that I'd, be set, that I'd be saying, actually, I agree with some of the stuff he said. I think low expectations are the blight of our education system. And I see so many young people um, patronised by what we teach them. I remember being in a science class, a year eight science class, and they were growing a seed in a cupboard. And I whispered to the lad, have you ever done that before? And he said, we did it in year two and year six, sir. And he was just too polite to say that to the teacher. So it's the third time we've been doing the same thing. Um, so we have to have our expectations. As I said earlier, students really like our work. And then the last thing, I, uh, two things I want to say. Um, I don't think, I've banned the use of the word uh, I'm gonna students to fulfil their potential. I never talk about potential. I never talk about a student's potential because we don't know what a student's potential is. Right? We don't know. It's such an arrogant thing to say. Um, and I think target setting just has two massive problems. Right? Um, it's, it, it's, it stops students' ambition to be better. You know, I've, I've got a grade six in my maths now. I don't need to work any harder. That's my target. That's all I want. I don't want a seven or an eight or a nine. I just don't get that mentality. So we don't 
we don't publish targets to students. We just get them to be to want to be as good as they can. And there's a brilliant essay by Tom Bennett where he says that. Well, how can you aim for a grade four or a grade five? Just everybody aim for a grade nine and see how close we can get, get to getting there. And like he says, if we don't all get there, we won't get worried about it as long as everybody's tried their best. That's key for me. Um, and there's the, the first book I wrote back in 2015. Um, and uh, there's a lad called Ross there on, on the title page. And, and Ross is a, a funny lad. It was a results day. Um, and uh, I always got on, on well with his, with his dad, Carl. Uh, and Carl used to be a prison officer on the Isle of Wight, and he looked after one or two of the Crays. Um, and he was, he, he was called Ross Hardman and Carl Hardman. And um, I, I remember uh, once that um, we'd kept Ross behind for, for a detention. Uh, and um, he, well, we didn't actually, we didn't know, he, he got home late. So his dad rang us and said, Ross tells me um, that you've kept him behind for a detention. And you didn't give us 24 hours notice. And I said, Car and he said it, it was for a German, it was for his German. And I looked it up on the screen and was chatting to Carl. I said, Carl, I said, Ross, Carl doesn't even take German at GCSE. So how did he have a detention for German? And he laughed and clearly the lab was, had gone round to his mates and was lying. So that was results day. And he's sort of running out from behind the screen, behind the, behind the, um, behind the curtain in the, in the hall and comes up to me and says, oh, I've got a few B's and C's. I can stay on in the sixth floor. My dad will be delighted. He said, I'd hug you if I could. Oh, I said, he can if you want to. So he, he gave me this big hug in the middle of the hall. Um, and uh, 10 minutes later, the press photographer who was there, so I've just got this brilliant photo of you um, with this lad's giving you a hug. And you can see me there giggling at him. Um, so it went up on the, on the um, press website and I emailed his dad. I said, there's a lovely photo, Carl, of me, me and the boy Ross um, at 11.59 on the timeline on the, on the press website. And he emailed me back. He said, oh, I love the picture. Um, we all love it in the office. And we we're wondering if that's his German GCSE result he's got in his hand. Um, so you can have really great relationships with parents, um, no matter what. And uh, it was one of the highlights of my career. And that's why it's on the front page of the book. Um, and then people cite this, this quotation from me around the place. I've cited lots of other people. That's one from me. Okay. So never patronize people, never think that pastoral care um, and being soft with, with, with students and not insisting that they work really hard and get great results is the right thing to do. Because in the end, as you go, you go back to the beginning with Thomas Sewell, um, when they fail to get great results because of, of that attitude, um, the people that um, are, are affected by it are our students. Thank you so much, uh, John. That was absolutely fantastic. And um, that particularly that last message there about um, best set of exam results. I tried to sc screenshot it quickly because uh, that yeah. is definitely uh, the best mantra that you can have for students. Um, a couple of questions come in already. Um, uh, Paul, I think it is, is saying thank you very much. Really helpful advice. Uh, this is something that uh, I remember thinking the same when I was an NQT and I fell foul of it. Um, I've had a large amount of teachers tell me, say goodbye to your personal time, uh, evenings, etc. I'm not going into this naively without thinking I'll need to spend a large amount of time developing myself. But what would be your best advice for maintaining a good balance of work and personal life? Yeah, I... I um. I there's lots of, there's lots to unpick there really. Uh, there's a few things. I think I think the the, the school's marking of feedback policy is crucial, um, and having a sensible one, and, and knowing that the best feedback is feedback in the moment, um, you know, immediate feedback in the classroom, often verbal, um, rather than hours and hours of, of marking and marking and marking. I do think. Um, early on in your career it takes it much longer to to plan a lesson than it does when you get to to you know when you get securely into um your career and you have lots more resources and you it's a bit like starting a car you use lots of lots of petrol in, in the opening to get the car going but once you're going um it becomes that much easier and that much more 
um, economical. So, so I think that's that's true. I'm glad you've got an idea. It is a, it is a time consuming job, and it's a job that is is worth doing well. You do. I always look at I always look at it as having 13 weeks holiday a year. But I think that for me, that's about seven weeks holiday a year, um, and then six weeks where I work um, flexibly because you have to do that kind of that, that kind of catching up and stuff. Um, I, I think nothing is more important than your home life. And if you go on my website, there's a there's a web there's a um, story I tell, and the, and the and the and the post is called um, "This Much to Know About Why Family um, Why Family Comes First or something Why Family Matters Why Why your Why your family must come first. And I tell the story of of my life and and how I nearly missed my boys growing up completely because I was working so hard and how pointless it is to work and to be that that overwhelmed that into it um it is a job you should be passionate about but it's a job you should keep in perspective um and I think that's really crucial uh, and so um when I realized that and it's, it's a very specific moment in my life um, back in 2011, I think it was 2012. I determined at that point, and you can go, you can go and read the read the um, the blog. I determined at that blo- at that point that I would always, always do what my two boys asked me to do, no matter how busy I was. I would always do it, and I've stuck to that fiercely, even now at 20 and 24. Um, and no one died. It was absolutely fine, actually. Um, just doing doing enough. Sometimes just enough is good enough. Uh, and I think that, that, you have to be that way. And I think you're much better. You're much better to be energetic and refreshed and um, ready to teach and teach good lessons rather than turning up um, to work having marked all evening and be completely knackered. Uh, preserve some of yourself for the. Um, for, for, for the classroom and lastly just find stuff to do that's not nothing to do with teaching so you know Caroline was joking there about my my, my fishing but fishing is important to me um, writing is important to me not just about education you know one of my, one of my latest books is about is about fishing um, and I think that's really important having stuff outside of, of school that is nothing to do with your work I think is absolutely crucial so there's a few things there um, do the importance, prioritise relentlessly and ruthlessly um, and make sure that you don't uh, um, lose sight of how important your family and, you, and, and the rest of your life is. Thanks very much, John. Uh, any more questions for John? Please put them in the chat. Um, Catherine uh, says, please thank John. Very enlightening presentation and very entertaining as Good. well. <laughs> so I, I would just like to thank you so much for your time uh, this morning, John. Um, I know that it's coming to the end of term and the end of what has been a fantastic career for you. And I'm sure that you've got lots of things planned in school um, for the next. I don't know. I, people keep taking photos of me. I have no idea what they're doing. Um, <laughs> I don't want to know. Um, um, well, if you follow John on Twitter, I'm sure you'll have uh, yeah. you, you'll have some stories to tell over the next couple of weeks. Oh, oh. Yeah. But I'm sure you all want to join me in thanking uh, John. Um, sorry, there is another question. Oh. It says, you mentioned discussing and analysing class results with the whole school. Can you um, talk a bit more about having a positive attitude about results? Yeah, what I do is, um, I think there's lots of information about, about outcomes, aren't there? Right. So I think it's really important. If, you, if you've done something in class, you've changed your practice, I think it's really good to evaluate it. So... Um, what I do, I do quite in-depth analysis of the results. I go on the QLA and look at, um, you know, the question level analysis. And a couple of years ago, I was working really hard on extended writing in economics A-level answers, um, especially the evaluative paragraphs at the end. And we've done a load of work on it. And it, I was able to go in, um, look at what they got for the 25 markers and determine whether it made the difference. Um, to some extent, there is some causality, I think. And I could also look at the kind of essays they're providing for me before I intervened and, and gave them some direct instruction about it and afterwards. Um, so I will stand in front, of, stand in front of the of the whole school, and I will go through what what exam results students um, got. Um, 
where they are on Alps or where they are on the P8 score, um, how they were against their, their academic targets um, at, at GCSE. And um, when I, I remember when I first taught economics about seven years ago, I got a seven on Alps, which is pretty dire. Um, and then I could, and I had to stand in front of the whole of the whole school, and then I could say, "Look, this is what I'm going to do next year to try and be better, and I'll report to you next year." So, Alps wise, in the first three years of teaching A level economics, I went from a seven to a five to a two, um, and I just showed them I was getting better and just working at my practice. So I modelled what I wanted to, them to do in the same way as you you do that for students. You know, I modelled the behaviours I wanted to see, and I think that's a crucial thing for for a leader. Thanks, John. Um, just uh, tell us what your Twitter handle is. I'll type it in the chat. It's really easy, at John Tomset. No H, no P in Tomset, at John Tomset. No H in no P in Tomset, like that. T-O-M-S-E-T-T, -T, just yeah. as it got on my screen, yeah. So if you do, uh, yeah, if you do want to follow Tom, like I said, I'm sure you'll, um, you'll not uh, regret it. Lots of good advice, uh, links to good blogs, and um, obviously news of uh, the next couple of weeks as well. <laughs> okay. thanks Caroline thanks everybody for listening um, have a lovely day thank you thanks very much John bye bye, -bye.